the school gave a boy an accommodation to feel safe and comfortable in the bathroom of the sex he identifies with. But you did not give the girl the accommodation to feel safe and comfortable in the bathroom of her biological sex. That sounds like sex discrimination. Sure does. So what I want to see happen is for people to start bringing sex discrimination claims in these instances. Now, you may not be invalidating the policy, but you're going to render the policy pretty toothless when schools start getting hit with sex discrimination claim after sex discrimination claim. Joyful Warriors, we are joined by a Joyful Warrior dad now, Ian Pryor. I met Ian when I first started doing advocacy work for Moms for Liberty. We were in a meeting together talking about strategy, talking about what's happening in America's public schools, and really just continuing to be shocked at there's no bottom here, is there, Ian? It seems like every day we're hearing more and more stories about things happening in America's public schools, and it's still shocking to me. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's crazy the amount of phone calls that I get from parents. How do, how do I fix this? And it, it's so hard, right? I mean, even, in, even where I am in Loudoun County, where the superintendent was indicted, the school spokesperson was indicted, right? They're still investigating. They're still, you know, all this stuff is going on, but the schools continue to double down, whether it's SEL, whether it's bathroom policy, locker room policy, whether it's critical race theory, teacher trainings, they don't care. And so you have to keep going. So let's back up for a second and let's let people know a little bit about you. Sure. So you're from Loudoun County, Virginia. For those that may have heard about Loudoun but aren't remembering exactly um, how you got on the map as far as schools are concerned, why don't you give us a little taste of how you got yeah. involved and what was happening in Loudoun? So it was interesting. I, I really started in, I think, the summer of 2020. Uh, and I, I wanted to do some investigative work, and I found that Loudoun County Public Schools was paying half a million dollars to this company called the Equity Collaborative um, to really just sort of you know create this indoctrination program, right? And you know I put that out there. I wrote an op-ed in the Federalist about what I found. Fast forward to March of 2021, and there was a private Facebook group called the Anti-Racist Parents of Loudoun County. And in that group were six school board members, our Soros-backed Commonwealth attorney, and lots of angry activists. Crazy. And uh, there was a call to action by one of the members that, you know, we, these people, we need to publicly expose them. We need to send mailers. We need to hack their websites, right, and redirect them to pro-critical race theory websites. Uh, and then another woman says, all right, here's how we're going to list all these people. And they proceeded to list, you know, something like 70 people, you know. And, um, you know, I found my name on that list and I said, well, you know, I've been a lawyer for 10 years. I've been in national politics for 10 years. Uh, and it's on. And so we really mobilized people to try and remove school board members, the ones that were in that group. And that was the start of it. But it just went so many different places over the course of really two years where, you know, they put a teacher on um, suspension because he went to a school board meeting and spoke up against Tanner, their uh, pronoun policy, Tanner, Tanner Cross. Tanner Cross, yeah. yeah. And that same week, there was a sexual assault in a bathroom. And when the superintendent was asked a month later, are there any sexual assaults in bathrooms? Nope. Mm -hmm. Right? And then we found out that they moved this kid to another school where he committed a second sexual assault and was arrested for it. And then it was... They, they lied to us. They got up there at the school board meeting and the superintendent lied to us and most of the school board did nothing. They just sat there and let it happen. That ultimately you know, galvanized people across Virginia and probably led to the election of Glenn Youngkin, Winsome Sears, Jason Meares. Yep. When Glenn Youngkin gets in office, he authorizes Jason Meares to investigate Loudoun County Public Schools. They investigate, they convene a special grand jury, special grand jury report comes out, basically like 90% of everything we said, the special grand jury confirmed. Wow. And then they indicted the superintendent and they indicted the spokesperson. So, you know, it's, parents should go out there and not be afraid. I mean, that you will get results, but you have to be strategic, you have to be tactical, and um, you have to be on message. So I've been interviewing a lot of people here at CPAC, right? And, and I've been interviewing a lot of people who have not been involved in politics. Dr. McCullough, uh, Simone Gold, right? These are people that were not involved in politics. They've never considered themselves to be particularly political people. You and I were talking about it. Nobody ever believes me, but I was NPA for most of my life. Like, just not, 
you know, super into any party, but really focused on issues. You were saying that you had been much the same in your life, but we find ourselves in this moment where everything is being politicized, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, a message to parents about, you know, not being involved in politics and now all of a sudden getting involved. Yeah, I mean, it's, I certainly worked in politics, much like I worked as a lawyer, right? So I worked for organizations as a spokesperson, but I was never particularly dogmatic about anything, right? Um, I never really focused on a specific issue. It was, it was a job. Right. And then I found myself in this situation. I found a lot of parents in this situation, too. And they, don't, they didn't necessarily vote and put on their jersey and say, I'm going to go vote Republican. That, that wasn't what they were about. They were about this issue. Right. And so we had a lot of Democrats. We had independents. We had Republicans. It wasn't about party politics. It was about the politics of the schools. And so, you know, one of the things I always get from the left is, oh, they, they, he was sent by the GOP to, to road test a, a strategy. Like, that is a really cool story. And you should sell that script to Hollywood. But I'm going to actually write the real story and sell it to people with brains because that's not how it went down right. and that's not how it's going down all across the country. No, but thank God that education and parental rights have become the priority for candidates and elected officials that it has become. And I really credit you. I know I've said to you before, you're like the OG <laughs> parent activist. I credit you with really, you know, looking at what was happening in Loudoun and saying it doesn't have to be like this and we can mobilize and get involved and we can change who is serving on our school board, which ultimately is going to have a huge impact impact on your community. So Scott Smith, the gentleman, the father that mm -hmm. you spoke about, whose daughter was raped in a bathroom in Loudoun County, got to speak in front of uh, Speaker McCarthy, Elise Stefanik, Julia Letlow, Virginia Fox, Aaron Bean the other day. Uh, the Speaker McCarthy, there's been a, a, a bill introduced, the Parents' Bill of Rights. Um, can we talk a little bit about the federal government, their role in education versus states' rights, and where you think parental rights should be right now in America? Well, you know, the parental rights are guaranteed under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, but there's not a lot of case law out there about this, because we've only really seen Who would this, have thought, this Ian? going on over the past <laughs> couple of years. And so it, it's very difficult to... Um, you know, to go to court and say, well, you, you need to enforce parental rights. There's no, there's no precedent. Right. We've never seen this. So it really does, it is incumbent on, certainly on the federal government to, to pass this bill because this bill is going to give parents statutory rights as well. And hopefully there's an enforcement mechanism where, you know, if these rights are violated, they can take, they can take these school districts to court under, you know, 1983. Um, the PPRA, we talk about the PPRA. People Protection an, Rights Act, for those of you that don't know, federal legislation that was meant to protect children from uh, values clarification happening in schools, surveys being yep. given in schools, right? But but it's being completely ignored. We know kids are being given surveys every day. They're given surveys every day. Parents aren't given the right to inspect See the curriculum, curriculum as they're supposed yep. to. And I think this bill of uh, Parents' Bill of Rights really clarifies a lot of what the Protection of Pupil Rights Amendment should do and will do going forward. But we know that the Biden administration right. has, has announced that they're going to do a new rulemaking on the PPRA in August. And so what's the problem, right? What, what, how, are they gonna, how are they going to impact the PPRA to give parents less rights? That's the question we need to be asking. And, Why and, does any elected official want to give parents less rights? Well, you know, because the, the teachers unions are, are dumping millions of dollars into, into their campaigns. Um, but one of the things at America First Legal, we filed a, a Freedom of Information Act to kind of really get behind, like, well, what's the reason for this, right? right. So we'll see uh, what we get from that, and we have to take action to, to force the release of those documents. Um, I really want to know, and we really want to know, what the motivation here is of the Biden administration uh, to potentially roll back this very important uh, law. Yeah, I want to say thank you to you, Stephen Miller, others at America First Legal. I, I think the work that you're doing is really on the cutting edge of the work that needs to be done in America. And I know I've come to you, and so thank you for allowing Moms for Liberty to come to you with different things that are happening across the country and, and being able to address some of these issues, because parents know it's wrong. Right? Right. They see that their parental rights are being violated, other things that are happening to their children, freedoms and liberties taken away. But if there is no accountability measure, if there is no way to hold anyone accountable for what's happening, if there isn't a private right of action, no teeth in mm -hmm. any of these laws, then they might as well not be written, right? And so we've talked a lot about, about that accountability piece. 
American parents, are they weary right now? I want to talk about this book that you wrote, Parents of the World Unite, How to Save Our Schools from the Left's Radical Agenda. Um, this is a kind of a playbook, right? Yeah. You talk a little bit about how parents that want to get involved and learn how to fight and navigate this space can use this book. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so, you know, you think about Saul Alinsky's uh, Rules for Radicals sure. um, that the left has been using as a playbook for a while. But, you know, the, the book actually teaches you some lessons about how to operate. So I tried to, you know, kind of do something very similar by telling the Loudoun County story in 12 chapters where each chapter is sort of a strategy. Right. What were we trying to do? What was the lesson that we learned and how can this be applied? You know, I've had a lot of people over the past two years say, how did you do what you did in Loudoun County? And I thought, well, the best way for me to do that is to tell the story and sort of tell it in, in this lesson format. Sure. Um, and that's really what the book is about. And I will say, I mean, it comes out on March 21st. You should buy two copies, one for yourself, and then one for the most woke, annoying person you know, and send that to them on April Fool's Day, because they are going to hate this book. Well, they might be on your school board, so maybe you yeah. just buy a couple copies for your school yeah, board and your superintendent, That's a great idea. right? I'm yeah. send it to them. That's, there you go. Um, so you go over some of the steps we can take in the book. Advice about being a human being and a father and being hit with a lot of arrows all it's the time. It's tough. I mean, it's, you know, it is. Uh, when I got into this, I certainly thought, oh, you know, you're, we're going to do this. And um, I didn't expect the attacks to come like they have. Right. Uh, but you just got to be tough. I mean, you got to put on your suit of armor and go out there. You know, you can you can watch this happen and say, this is terrible. You know, I'm going to avoid this at all costs. Right. You can watch the fight happen or you can get in the fight. And I chose to get in the fight. And a lot of people have chosen to get in the fight. And it's important to get in the fight because if people don't push back on this, where are we going to be in 10 years, 20 years? What kind of country are we going to be giving to our children? What kind of country are they going to be inheriting? Right now, you can say, well, send your kid to private school. All right, well, that's like 10% of the, the population. So you can have 10% of the population that you know may be normal, and then you have the rest of the 90% of the population that has gone through these public schools and taught to be a victim at all costs. Well, and so you said you, know, you can send your kids to private schools, but you and I have seen as we have been on this journey, right, for the past few years is there really is no safe place. No. It doesn't matter what color your skin is, what religion you practice, how much money you have, some of the things that are happening in this country, right? Uh, boys and girls' bathrooms, uh, boys competing against girls in sports, uh, woke ideology and CRT entering your child's classroom, queer theory. Uh, that happens at public schools. That's happening at private schools, too. Let's talk about bathrooms. Yep. What? I mean, if you had told me hmm. in 2016 when I got on the school board, hey, Tiffany, you should pass a policy that says only boys use the boys room, right? I would have said, oh, I mean, there are so many policies we can pass. Do we really need to do that? Right? Who would have thought, just much like parental rights, who would have thought that we needed to clarify that? But yet, we have co-ed bathrooms, gang style, that's what they call them, right? The big bathrooms, co-ed bathrooms happening all over the country, including even in some states, in some counties in Florida. So let's talk about bathrooms. What do we well, do? Well, I mean, first of all, you know, I was so relieved to see in, in December the, the Adams versus St. John's County decision yes. from the 11th Circuit. I mean, that's huge. Um, hopefully that, that gets to the Supreme Court. Um, but we're seeing it everywhere, right? And we, we continue to see it in Loudoun County. The whole issue in Loudoun County was really about that bathroom policy, right? So they wanted to pass this bathroom policy um, that opened up bathrooms to whatever you identified on that particular day. And that's why they covered up that sexual assault, because they knew if that would come out, then that bathroom policy was going to be dead on arrival for a vote. But I still continue. And, I, you know, in, in the Fourth Circuit, which is where we are in Virginia, we have this case, Grim versus Gloucester County. And that's the opposite of the Adams decision in the 11th Circuit, where they said, well, a kid has an equal protection right to use the bathroom of the sex that they identify with, right? And what conservatives have been doing, and we've all been trying this, is, is to really throw an 80-yard touchdown pass and get these bathroom um, policies invalidated on constitutional grounds, right? right? So we say, all right, this is unconstitutional because it violates somebody's uh, First Amendment religious rights, or this is unconstitutional because it violates parents' 14th Amendment rights to, to raise their children. Right. You know, I've been kind of toying with this idea, though, that there's a simpler way and a more effective way to handle this based on some of the calls I've gotten this week. Now, I would back everybody up to the, the Bostick versus Clayton County decision from the Supreme Court, where you had a, a man that was identifying as a woman that worked, I think, at a funeral home and was fired, and he takes his case to the Supreme Court, and Gorsuch writes the opinion. And they didn't find that you know, gender identity was a protected class, but Gorsuch said, well, this is a man, 
that's dressing up as a woman and he was fired for that. If it was a woman, he wouldn't have been fired. There wouldn't be the adverse actions. Therefore, this is sex discrimination, right? Okay, let's take that and let's apply it to bathrooms. What I've been hearing is that girls go into a bathroom, they tell their parents that, oh, there's a boy in the bathroom, he's a transgender boy, uh, six foot tall, you know, the parent contacts the school. The school says, well, that's the policy. If you don't like it, you can use a single use bathroom or you can go see the unified mental health team. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you're telling me that the school gave a boy an accommodation to feel safe and comfortable in the bathroom of the sex he identifies with. But you did not give the girl the accommodation to feel safe and comfortable in the bathroom of her biological sex. That sounds like sex discrimination. Sure does. So what I want to see happen is for people to start bringing sex discrimination claims in these instances. Now, you may not be invalidating the policy, but you're going to render the policy pretty toothless when schools start getting hit with sex discrimination claim after sex discrimination claim. No, I think you're absolutely right. So school boards, we've seen, and I saw it in my own local community, they have immunity, right? So they're, they are covered by the school district, by the government. When school board members start making decisions that are not in line with the laws and statutes of their state, at what point do they lose those protections? Well, I mean, that is, that's something that has to be legislated. Uh, you know, if, if a school board decision is done intentionally, maliciously, and you can prove that, well, then it's no longer negligence and they're not protected by sovereign immunity. That's very tough to prove, but you're always going to have the, the district itself and the superintendent, the people that enforce these, these issues, they're going to be liable under 1983 or whatever state law. So there are methods to go after these school districts in federal court and in state court. It just really takes parents to step up and say, I want to be a plaintiff. So the question would be like with the masking or, or with the bathroom, for example, knowing that there's been harm. You've probably heard me say before, parents don't put a bike helmet on their child because their child's been hurt on a bike before. You put a bike helmet on your kid because you know they might get hurt on right. a bike, right? So parents act in protection of their children. American parents, especially Moms for Liberty, you know, we have 270 chapters in 44 states. They talk to each other. And we know what happens in California does not stay in California. It is not Vegas, right? Mm -hmm. They take all of that stuff, Washington, Oregon, California, and now we're seeing it in Minnesota and Michigan and New York and Vermont. They're pushing it out across the country. So I guess the really the question becomes, can we get ahead of some of this? How do we encourage legislators and other people to start putting in protections so that before boys are in the girls' bathroom, right, we're not we're we're setting it up so boys are not allowed in the girls' bathroom. And I guess, you know, that's yeah. a difficult thing to do because a lot of times they want to say, well, where's the harm? Show me where the harm has been. Is the harm enough somewhere else to, val to, to, to make it so that you pass a law in your state? Yeah, well, I think there's a lot already in the law. It's just how the laws are enforced, right? So, for example, Title IX, and as the, the court in the 11th Circuit said, when Title IX was passed, it was, what, 1972? The word sex meant biological sex. It still means biological sex, sure but certainly does. in 1972 it meant biological sex. That's there. Yeah. Now, it doesn't matter what the Biden administration says or does, the law is the law, right? So it's incumbent upon parents, one, to elect school board members that will enforce the law, but also I guess we're going to have to start clarifying the law in state legislatures, right? We're going to have to start clarifying that sex means biological sex, and we have to stop discriminating against one group of people to protect or you know um, accommodate another group of people, right? And that's what we're doing. And that's basically the Ibram Kendi model, which is well, you know, present discrimination is fine uh, because of past discrimination, so it's okay. Yeah. But that's what we're doing. We're pitting different groups against each other by discriminating all over the place. So we really need to start looking at our, our civil rights laws and our anti-discrimination laws and, and giving a hard look at what is constitutional and what is not. Because once you start, you know, a lot of these, these cases um, are, are somebody challenging, like I said, the policy, right? right, or the decision. And it's never the two rights intersecting in the case. That's what we need to start developing, is where these two rights are intersecting, and then make a court say, 
Well, if you're a girl, you're just going to have to Deal suck it up. That. Right, right, right. No judge is going to say that. Well, maybe some judges will say well, let's that. let's talk but. about that, though. I mean, I don't know. Maybe some judges would say that. I mean, I, I think we're looking at a judicial system that really is taking a direction oftentimes that's the opposite of what many American people want or think needs to happen in America. And, and I'm going to bring up two cases in, in federal court cases that have been lost recently that are about to be appealed or are being appealed. Um, it, the Ludlow versus Foot case up in uh, Massachusetts and then January Little. John, the Leon County case, where both of two children in Massachusetts, one in, in Florida, specifically in these cases, uh, behind closed doors, six pages of forms filled out, right? Adults with a child without the parent. I'm hearing the judge in these cases did not dispute any of the facts of the case but said that it didn't shock the conscience. So for moms and dads who really haven't been involved in, in, in you know, legal issues, right? Maybe you get sued or your business or something, but you're not dealing with the, the, the legal system often in a normal person's life. What does it mean that the court says shock the conscience? That sounds like a values-based decision. <laughs> yeah, well, it means that the judge is, doesn't have a, a good head on his or her shoulders because that clearly should shock everybody's conscience. So, so Let's take this a, a different step, right? And um, your son or daughter goes to the, um, the health department and says, you know, I've got a real bad problem with my elbow. And the school starts giving them opioids. And now your kid's addicted to opioids. And they don't tell you that they were giving your kids Percocets or Vicodin or Oxycontin. Would you have a case then? Right? I mean, that's what's happening. They are essentially administering medical care. Yeah, they're right? setting that's a what child they call on it. a track, a, a trajectory. Yeah. The school to scalpel pipeline, right? And that's what I, I talk about. The school starts very young with these books. Let's, yeah. let's accept the fact that biological sex is a myth, right? It could, it could be, be a changed. boy or a girl or a tree or yeah, not a Yeah, follow the science with COVID and masks and vaccines, but don't follow the science that has existed for 40,000 years. Got it. So they do that, and then you get to start using the bathroom you want. You get to get new pronouns. You get your new pronouns. You get your Zazer. new name. And then, you know, yeah. you're, you're a teenager, and you're trying to fit in. And you're like, you know what? I get to have this little special protected class that I'm a part of. I get right. to have, a like, a super status. I'm going to start identifying as a, a different sex. They don't tell you. They don't tell you the parent, right? And then they really go down that road. They really get into it. They're looking at all the TikTok videos. They're getting binders. And they're like, I want to get on puberty blockers. I want to get on cross-sex hormones. And they go and they get surgery. And then two years later, they realize, what have I done? Who's picking that, up the pieces? Right. Who's picking up the pieces? It's not the school. It's, the mom it's not the it's superintendent or the pupil services super, uh, you know, director. It's the parents. Yeah. It's the child. And so how does that not shock the conscience? These judges need to understand this does not happen in isolation. It's not just, oh, it's just kids being kids. This has disastrous effects later in life and, you know, almost a year later for some people, the, the detransition of community. So they need to really understand what is at stake here. And one of the most frustrating things is they say, well, did you ask, right? Did, did you, the parent, ask if your child was identifying as a different sex? Like, no. But what if I asked that? And what if I said, is my child um, transgender? And the school says, no, your child isn't. And they don't tell me, oh, but she's gender fluid. But you right. didn't ask the question right. So how many times Sounds do you like have to ask? like the public records requests that you right. submit, they play games with. Yeah, how many times do you have to ask that question? No, it should be on the schools to disclose that information. Right. Just like if your kid breaks their arm at school, they have, they have to, to disclose it. Yep. No, 100%, you're absolutely right. So parents of the world unite. I think it's happening. I really do. I think the best hope for America truly lies with parents and then the generation of kids that the parents are raising, because hopefully our children will recognize the threat that has come to our country and will be able to fight it and beat it back. And then our children will be raised with an understanding of how special America is and how hard we fought for it. So Joyful Warriors is about fighting like hell with a smile on your face because it's a privilege to fight for this country and I am proud to fight with you. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming, Ian. I really appreciate it. Cool.